Well, um, thank you all for coming. Delighted to have uh, uh, a nice group of people listening, and we're very excited about this panel. Let me, like, you know, let me just give a brief introduction. My name is Alex Abdo. I'm the litigation director of the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University. We have about an hour and 15 minutes uh, uh, on our panel. We'll spend probably about the first hour discussing amongst ourselves and then open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, if you ask questions throughout, and please feel free to, I will do my best to look at those and where I can insert them into the conversation, I will. So if you ask them, go ahead and do that. Um, but we'll have a dedicated uh, chunk of time at the end uh, to go through some more of those. And I think about an hour of the way through the panel, I'll um, let everyone know your CLE affirmation code. So uh, stay tuned for that. So the, the task of our panel uh, is to explore the relationship between the First Amendment and uh, regulation of the social media platforms. And in particular, whether the First Amendment is a barrier to that regulation. And we have a fantastic panel to take that question on. I'm gonna give you just very short introductions of everyone. You can find out more information on uh, the conference website, which should be linked to in the chat. Uh, we have Jack Balkan, who is the Knight Professor of Constitutional Law and the First Amendment at Yale Law School. He is the founder and director of Yale's Information Society Project and the faculty director of the, Ames, of the Abrams Institute, which is our host today. We have Daphne Keller, uh, who is the director of the Program on Platform Regulation at Stanford Cyber Policy Center. And she's formerly an associate general counsel at Google. So we may try to lean on her, uh, her inside perspective uh, on that as well. And we have Nate Persily, who is the James V. McClatchy Professor of Law at Stanford Law School and the founding co-director of uh, Stanford Cyber Policy Center. So before we dive into this question of whether the First Amendment is a barrier to regulation of the social media companies, I want to start by asking our panelists to weigh in on whether and why we might want to regulate social media. Uh, it's hard to analyze the free speech implications of efforts to regulate social media without first understanding exactly what those regulations uh, look like. Uh, and in understanding what they might look like, we have to have a clear sense of what problem we're trying to solve. Um, and so the first question I want to ask, and I'll start with you, Jack, is what do we as a society want from the social media companies? There's, there's been a lot of criticism of the companies most recently from the president himself focused on anything from the immense power they wield over public discourse to the spread of hate and abuse on their services to the lack of legal recourse for those whose posts and accounts are taken down. Um, and we've seen a lot of responses, uh, you know, proposals meant to address some of those problems, but it's not easy to tell from those proposals what problems are directed at and ultimately what role we should expect of the social media platforms in our society. So, so there's the question, what do we want from them? Um, okay, that's a great question. Um, it's important to understand that internet communications um, is divided into various layers. And so it's important to distinguish social media companies from what I call internet, uh, basic internet services. So that's the broadband companies, the domain name system, uh, caching services, defense services and also the, the uh, web hosting services, and also distinguish it from the payment systems, uh, uh, PayPal, um, MasterCard, and Visa. They're on the top layer, if you will, of internet communication. And um, the real question is, what's their social function? Uh, their social function, I would say, uh, in three big buckets are to organize, uh, facilitate, and curate uh, public discourse. That's what they do. Uh, they organize it, they make it easy for you to find other people and talk to them, and they facilitate it. Uh, you know, they lower the costs of, of uh, broadcasting to lots of people, and they curate it. Uh, curation is really important because if you don't have some kind of civility rules, safety rules, uh, the uh, things uh, quickly becomes anarchy, um, and it quickly becomes something nobody wants to use. So they have to do those things. They have to organize, facilitate, and curate. Once they get into curation, they're not neutral conduits. They're not neutral anymore. They make all sorts of policy choices. Uh, they have to make decisions about what's required for civility, what's required for safety, uh, what's required for security. And because they have to do that, in other words, they can't avoid it. They'll get criticized for avoiding it as well as for doing it. It's really a bad idea if there's only a small number of them. Uh, so in other words, once you understand what their social function is, you understand that it's a really bad idea to have only a small number of these companies. There have to be lots of different companies with lots of different affordances and, uh, and different uh, possible norms about organiza uh, the organization of public discourse. A lot of our problems stem from the fact that uh, for various reasons having to do with the way law has been developed, but also have to do with economic features and first mover effects. 
um, we have only a small number of these companies and they're global uh, and they have enormous power. And precisely because they have enormous power, they're constantly being criticized for doing what they're supposed to do, which is engage in the curation of public discourse. And also for not do, for doing what they're not supposed to do, which is not curating when they should be curating. Um, but essentially you have to understand that they play a crucial role that is different than the role played by newspapers and different than the role played by telecommunications companies and telephone companies. They organize discourse, they curate discourse as well as making it possible. That's the source of most of the problems and debates we're having. Jack, one follow up for you, but before that, a couple of comments from uh, folks online saying it's a little hard to hear you. I don't know if there's anything you can do to, to address that. Um, All right, I'll, I'll do my best, but I, I tend to have this kind of voice that's very hard to hear, even harder <laughs> to understand. Uh, so so the, uh, one follow up, so if I'm hearing you correctly then, um, your description of what we want focuses on a, a kind of particular social arrangement of these sorts of social media platforms as institutions and that we should care less about what any individual one of these platforms looks like, at least so long as we have that particular arrangement, you know, you know, and we have a diversity of platforms and affordances. Am I understanding you correctly? And so that in your ideal end state, we wouldn't worry so much about content on these platforms. We'd focus more on the structure of, of them or the structure of the, the ecosystem. Yeah, when we get to the when we get to talking about particular regulations, we can talk about specific uh, kinds of regulations we might want. But but it's really important to understand that this is a moving target. We are only ten years into this world, um, and if you thought about the development of newspapers over the course of American history, wow, they really changed from the founding up until the the, the 21st century. This is really really short space of time, and we have to think big picture about the kind of structure we want and what their, their obligations are. But I think we already know that if you have a system with only a small number of them, you're gonna have all sorts of problems like the problems we're seeing right now. And by the way, I, I should just add, much easier for governments to co-opt them and drive them to do the government's dirty work if there are only, uh, only a small number of them. So that's a great, I think, segue to Daphne. So um, you, you should all feel free to, to jump in without me prompting with questions, but I'm, I'm gonna prompt now. So Daphne, in your paper, the one, the one that was circulated along with uh, Jack's for the conference materials, one of the specific problems you worry about is what you call job owning, which is um, official efforts to, uh, uh, to direct moderation policies at the platform. You might describe the executive order that Trump recently signed as one, you know, one type of job owning. Um, so, so do you agree with, um, do you agree with Jack at the broad level that this is the sort of arrangement we want, a lot of different platforms with a lot of different affordances. And if, and if you agree with that, do you think, or whether or not you agree with that, do you think it would actually insulate against the concern that you're most worried about in that paper? I, I do broadly agree that we want a diversity of platforms and a diversity of sort of um, speech rule sets um, that pe internet users can engage with as discursive communities. Uh, and, and I do think that that would help protect against the problem of um, j job owning, which might be Derek Bambauer's term. He's written about this a bunch, or I sometimes call it state action laundering. Um, this is where governments say, hey, platform, you know, it's a nice business you got there. It'd be a shame if we had to regulate it. By the way, I would like you to apply the following editorial policy. And the platforms are like, oh, all right. We gotcha. <laughs> you know, like I could fight you on this, but then you're going to come back at me with tax policy. You know, or with the, there. There are so many ways that um, that that lawmakers can make that threat effective. And I do think the executive order is like a really glaring, glaring example of this. Um, to, to your broader question about what it is that we want platforms to do, um, I think you know it's easy. We want them to take down bad speech and leave up good speech. Uh, which is another way of saying we will never agree on what we want them to do because we will never agree on what is bad speech and what is good speech. And, you know, that is another key reason why Jack's point is correct. We should abandon any idea that we're going to arrive at a universal content policy everybody agrees on and find some other goals. And those goals are not for the platforms to apply the First Amendment because they would be unusable cesspools if they did and nobody would like them. Um, you know, the goal has to be something else. And I agree, a diversity of rule sets is one really good goal 
there are a lot of really serious legal barriers to achieving that, which we can talk about in the, um, the later segment of this discussion. I think process protections when platforms take down content, that's another really legitimate goal and you see it everywhere from the Santa Clara principles, which is endorsed by a lot of civil society groups to what the executive order wants the FTC to do. <laughs> sort of, you know, users should know what the rules are and have an opportunity to appeal. Um, and then finally, transparency, I think, needs to be one of the goals. We cannot pass good laws or have good societal expectations of platforms if we don't have better information about what they can and cannot reasonably do and what the consequences are when they try to enforce particular rules. Um, please let me know if my headphones are causing weird noises and I will take them off. No, okay, I'll stop. There. I think they're good. Well, so Daphne, just one quick follow for you then. So, you know, the last few things you mentioned make me wonder whether you might, um, you might modify Jack's answer a little bit or append to it by saying, even if we have, you know, a, a diverse ecosystem, a heterogeneous speech environment online, we still would insist, we still might insist on certain rules that they all play by. We want, you know, certain procedural rights for people who are kicked out of the, you know, kicked off of any particular platform or certain transparency um, from those platforms. So we better understand the influencer having a public discourse, et cetera. Do you, is that right? Or do you think that those concerns would be um, that we wouldn't expect gov you know, government regulation to address those concerns in a world where we have 20 Facebooks and not one, with, you know, not one Facebook? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, as a consumer protection matter, you want to know what you're getting, you know, and so having a requirement that those 20 platforms be clear about those rules sounds good, but it doesn't matter nearly as much in a world where there are 20 Facebooks. You, where the procedural protections really, really matter is if the platforms have a legal obligation to take down the content. So if we were to move away from 230 to a world more like the one that Europe has now, where platforms have to respond to allegations of defamation or allegations that a post you know, invades someone's privacy in a way that violates the law, um, we know from just scabs of research over the years, the strong incentive is for platforms to just err on the side of taking things down and not protect user speech. Jack and others have called this collateral censorship. Uh, we know that bad actors abuse those systems to send bad faith notices to silence their critics or their competitors. Like there's just, there's this huge problem when the law says you have to respond and take things down. And that would be a huge problem for things like, imagine the Me Too movement in a world where Twitter had to respond take things down if some guy said it was defamatory. Um, so the procedural protections, things like the accused speaker getting to respond with counter notice, things like penalties for bad faith allegations, those become really, really important if what we're talking about is a legal mandate to take down speech. And, and those are protections um, that we will never get to if, we, if legislation is not the means to get there. You can't just have a standard that you lose immunity if you don't act reasonably and then hope that courts will invent counter notice requirements or any of these protections that are intended to protect the rights of parties who aren't usually present in the litigation. Um, so process matters a lot if takedown is mandatory. Nate, do you want to jump in on this? You know, anything you want to address, but in particular too, I I'm wondering whether you would push back at least a little bit on um, Maybe pushback is a wrong word, but you, you would create another caveat along the lines of the one Daphne is creating um, for certain types of speech that we care a lot about in certain contexts. You spend a lot of your time trying to think about how to protect U.S. elections from uh, interference, um, you know, unwanted interference. So uh, how do you think about the relationship of the obligations that you're thinking about trying to impose on um, the tech companies or the responsibilities you're trying to help them realize um, in relation to what we ultimately want from an online you know, speech environment. So you began this by asking, well, what do we want from the social media companies? And the question is, who's the we here? And um, even among individuals, there are contradictory impulses, right? So, um, you know, just to, to put it in the U.S. context, right, there's, you know, in general, those who are, who are pushing for greater takedowns want more, um, uh, you know, whether it's regulation of the social media companies to do it or self-regulation by them. They want more disinformation taken out in the electoral context and elsewhere, uh, hate speech, other types of dangerous speech. And then as you mentioned, um, greater regulation with respect to things that might manipulate the election or, or pose a threat to democracy. Uh, as we saw last week with the, um, the executive order, right? 
certainly on the conservative side, a concern about platform uh, bias against uh, conservatives and um, that they're you know, using their power um, in the speech marketplace to tilt things uh, in favor of liberal voices. Uh, and so, and then there, there's this kind of interesting joining on the extremes, right? Particularly in the antitrust realm, right? Where there's the fear of platform power on the one hand on the liberal side, uh, thinking that this corp you know, these corporations have um, monopolized the speech marketplace. And then a similar concern growing from the fears of liberal bias uh, from conservatives. And then while we're talking about just the, the, the sometimes contradictory arguments when it comes to moderation, right? These also are in the context of other impulses to regulate on whether it's antitrust or privacy or safety or transparency. That's some of the stuff that uh, Daphne was talking about. And so, um, you know, there, there, there are different impulses that are that are pushing in different and contradictory uh, directions. Um, just to, to deal specifically on the, on the election question, Right. One of the reasons people have focused on political advertising in particular is because this seems like a bite-sized problem that you could go after with a, a limited number of um, actors in, you know, the, the you know, basically Facebook and Google, and then you could uh, try to analogize what's happening in television to um, what's happening online. As the earlier panel today showed, though, that's, you know, there are lots of complexities as you try to uh, make the transition from television to uh, the online environment. And so a lot of uh, things get opened up. But we've seen, you know, a lot of action in that area um, and where the platforms have been experimenting, and obviously different countries have been experimenting. Um, whereas in the, you know, th there is also a lot of experimentation in, in terms of content moderation, but I think people realize that the, um, you know, if you're going to have a, a national rule on disinformation, for example, it's going to be really hard to apply without, um, you know, really uh, infringing on First Amendment rights. So on that point, I mean, is your, maybe a reframing of my original question, if you had to, if you had to describe what the metrics would be for judging um, the efforts of the social media companies to prevent political advertising, you know, misinformation through political advertising or foreign state interference in elections. Would you say that the, the problem is we don't have a uniform rule or maybe a kind of consensus understanding of what the uniform rule should be for the regulation of political advertising? Or is the problem that we don't have sufficient incentives for there to be a diversity of rules or an experimentation? Um, I mean, this is maybe just a, 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 the same, you know, maybe just a question about um, what we want in this particular arena. Um, homogeneity uh, through a rule that we can discern or heterogeneity um, in, you know, uh, brought about through the right incentive structure or economic arrangements? Well, let, let's just start with the, the first word you said, which is metrics here. One of the problems here is that we don't know what's actually happening inside the companies. That's why I've, I've spent the last two years trying to open up Facebook to the world research community and make their, their data available through this project called Social Science One. Um, and so in order to figure out the scale of these problems, you have to be able to get outsiders to have access to the data. Now, um, we, you know, as much uh, as we sort of rake the com companies over the coals about the scale of disinformation that's happening on the platform, we actually have no idea of what the real prevalence is of disinformation on these platforms. Sure, you're going to see you know, millions of examples of whatever phenomenon you search for, and that's one of the differences between the internet uh, platforms and legacy uh, media, which is that you can actually search for these things and then find millions of examples of them. But we don't really know as a share of what the average user experiences on this platform, how big a deal hate speech, disinformation, or other problems are. So you've got to get through that um, hoop first, which is to find out you know, what is it that you're even going to be measuring. Then, then the question is, all right, well, assume you can measure it. What's the right metric? Is you say, what, what, what's you know, what's the line that you're going to draw when the, whether there's a problem or not. Now, th to some extent, where, where I land is um, figure out whether the internet and the sort of platform environment is uniquely dangerous as compared to everything else that's happening uh, in the communication ecosystem, right? Focus on the problems that we think uh, Google and Facebook are uniquely posing. A lot of it comes from the economic concentration, the fact that they have so many eyeballs, and so there are ways to deal with that problem. 
Uh, but then also there are other sort of features of the internet environment, the privileging of virality, the privileging of anonymity, right? Echo chambers. There are all kinds of things that you could sort of focus on about the internet environment in particular, and then try to sort of go at those as opposed to having a kind of broad rule on hate speech, broad rule on disinformation, where it's not so clear why you should, would have a different rule, say, in, on the internet than you would on other speech. And again, the role, the, the role of that transparency would be, I mean, it could be a couple of things. One, it could be if you can make a convincing case publicly, including to Facebook, that prioritizing what people see on the basis of user engagement leads to all these, you know, bad, bad things downstream that maybe you'll convince them to change their ways. Is that how you see that the role of transparency or do you see it as enabling content, you know, regulation um, uh, legislation? It could, it could, well, it's going to do both, right? On the, I mean, to, there's to some extent the platforms don't want to know the answers to some of these questions because they're afraid of what it might say. Uh, the other is that legislators could be enlightened about the scale of these problems if they actually knew uh, what the problems were. I mean, this whole question of whether they're conservative bias in the takedown policies, right, is something that can be easily studied, right? as well as the scale of disinformation. It may be, look, suppose more, there's more disinformation on the, on the conservative side than there is on the on liberal side. Well, then you wouldn't be surprised if you found a neutral disinformation policy that then ends up having uh, disproportionate effects on one side, right? How much hate speech is there? I mean, it, my colleague, Josh Tucker, we have a book coming out on uh, social media and democracy in the fall. They did the largest study of hate speech on Twitter that's ever been uh, done uh, for the last few years. And while there are, again, millions of examples of hate speech on Twitter, they don't see kind of a monotonic increase, increase in hate speech over the last few years. And as a share of the total amount of speech, it's actually you know, very, very small. That doesn't mean it's not a problem. It just means that if you're going to take a meat cleaver to these uh, social media platforms and the speech that's on them, you better be sure that you're actually getting at the problem that you want to solve. That's great. So um, maybe we can, yeah, go ahead, Daphne. Yeah, and I'd say there's a really direct line from lack of transparency to dangerous laws getting passed. Um, so an example is that over the past five plus years, platforms have faced a lot of pressure, particularly in Europe, to combat violent extremist content. You know, appropriately, they, there has been focus on this. Um, and platforms increasingly say, you know what, we got this. We have machine learning, we have filters, we have these tools. You know, so don't bother regulating us because we can do this. Um, but but they, they've sent a message intentionally or not that this is something that can be automated. And the European Union now has a draft law in the final stages, the terrorist content regulation. And two of the three drafts say, platforms must use automated tools to detect and silence terrorist content. They bought into the idea that these tools exist and that they work. And meanwhile, civil society is up in arms. A and by the way, three different UN human rights rapporteurs wrote to the European lawmakers about this saying, wait a minute, there are huge problems with automated filters. They can't detect context. They take down news. They take down you know, things like the Syrian archive in Berlin lost a huge archive of um, videos documenting uh, human rights abuses. There's a huge problem with mandating filters, but since there's no transparency about what content is being filtered and what the errors are and what the disparate impact might be on users based on their language or religion or national background, all, all of these things are unknown. Lawmakers just go ahead and they're like, no, no, the platform said they could do this, so we're gonna mandate it. I just wanna throw in a point, just to amplify a point that, that Daphne made. There's a dialectic between uh, nation states, between national organizations and these companies. As these, these companies are much better at technical things than the, comp the countries will ever be. And the countries know that. So what the countries do is they tend to try to deputize these companies to do work for them, all kinds of work for them. Some of the work, which in fact is required by their national laws, but some of it, which is not even permitted by their national laws. That is, they see them as outgrowths of their ability to govern populations. And so a very large part of these debates has to do with whether or not it is appropriate for nations to try to claw these companies into their world and turn them into uh, bureaucracies of first resort. That's exactly what the European Union has done 
in trying to basically use AI to take care of uh, terrorist recruitment. So how, how do you draw the line, Jack, I suppose, between the sorts of um, non-structural interventions that, that people are drawn to? And, you know, because you're, you're, the paper that we circulated, your paper, paper titled How to Regulate and Not Regulate Social Media, focuses in large part on making, uh, on setting out an argument for why we should expect these social media platforms to become trusted intermediate institutions in, in the public sphere and public discourse. Um, and that, you know, that kind of operates at a... Um, nicely operates at a high level because it avoids some of the first amendment problems. And I take it that you think that's a virtue of, of approaching the, the, you know, the question in that way. Um, but how much do you think legislators have to dip into some of these thornier questions of content moderation, um, uh, you know, particularly around elections or the like? Uh, well, it, my general view is that states can prevent illegal uh, content that is illegal in their jurisdiction. So the United States has First Amendment. First Amendment shapes the limits on what government can require of really any actors, including social media companies. Germany has different free speech rules than the United States does. Uh, so it's uh, the limits of what it can do are different. But of course, it's important to understand that even uh, given Germany's views about uh, hate speech, NetCG basically goes further than what uh, you're, you're permitted to do under German constitutional law. So there's an additional objection having to do with what uh, Daphne was talking about in terms of the use of filters and also um, the problem of collateral censorship. Very important to understand. Secondly, even in a world in which you don't have lots of content moderation, you're going to have lots of public-private cooperation. And it's very important to understand that that's not going away. Uh, Nathaniel Gleischer couldn't be here, but if Nathaniel was here, he would tell you about all the times he deals with national governments about all sorts of issues, ranging from terrorism to election security to various other kinds of security questions. That's not going away. And that's, uh, that's just an endemic feature of uh, digital networks. And it's obvious to anybody who works in computer security, they understand that public-private cooperation is just central to how the whole thing works. That's also true in the, content, in the context of content moderation. So don't think of it totally in terms of the government basically ordering social media companies to do X, Y, and Z. Understand that there's a whole bunch of different things going on. What, but I, I wanna make sure that I'm not dodging your question. I do believe that there are certain forms of content regulation that are permissible with respect to social media companies, in addition to antitrust and privacy, which are two other important policy levers. But those have to do with primarily with the question of intermediary immunity. Here's a way to think about it. Some parts of intermediary immunity are required by the free speech principle. That is, in, in the United States, I have a view about how much of Section 230 is actually required by, uh, uh, by the First Amendment. Other parts are not required by the First Amendment. So that's just a question of policy. That is to say, the amount of intermediary immunity you want past the constitutional baseline is a question of policy. At that point, you are permitted, as, a, as, a, as the United States is permitted, to think about what it wants in return for the extra part that isn't required by the First Amendment. And you can think of an analogy, not a perfect analogy, but you can think of the analogy in this way. We have a deal that is struck with broadcasters. We basically give them an enormously valuable uh, resource in return for public interest obligations. That is okay under the Constitution, not because of scarcity, which is a crazy idea, it never made sense, but because it's a permissible bargain that does not violate the First Amendment. It's not an unconstitutional condition on the receipt of government payment. That's the way to think about Section 230 reform. Section 230 reform, it offers an opportunity for a limited form of public interest bargaining between the state and the recipients of the bargain, that is the Section 230 immunity. It's really important that you not go to the well too many times on this bargain. You figure out what you want from this bargain, because if you keep going back to the well over and over again and demanding more and more, eventually you'll get a disaster. But that's the way to think about the question. Can I, can I just add, sort of ask Jack a question on this though, which is that given that, what, Part of the difficulty in thinking about the bargain of 230, the potential bargain of 230 is also 
how to uh, treat the small and large platforms uh, because you might think that the bargain should look different right for the larger platforms than it would the smaller one but it's challenging to craft a law uh, uh, you know that, that's going to cover the field if what you're for if what you're talking about is content moderation right so I, I assume that what you what you would say is that all right when when a platform reaches a certain level of uh, dominance that then it the contract kicks in that then they have certain obligations that they wouldn't have otherwise in part because the smallest platforms look like speakers right they, they, they you want them to flourish and you don't want them to um, have any of this kind of regulation that might retard their growth i, I want to say that that what you say uh, i let you say is very sensible i am quite worried about um make it saying that only a small number of companies will be subject to the bargain I, I would I would push it down a little lower, if only because I'm imagining a world after we do antitrust uh, in which there's lots of companies, so there are a lot of medium-sized companies instead of just four large companies. So I would push it. I would push the point where this kicks in a little lower than perhaps people are imagining. But here's an example. Here's an example of a kind of bargain you might strike. And I and again, I'm not saying it's the best bargain, but it's an example I get in the paper. You could say if you want Section 230 immunity you have to uh, adopt publisher liability. And you can, guys can explain what that means. Publisher liability, if this is an advertisement of any kind, commercial or political. That is, as long as you basically have struck a financial deal for the publication of this information, that is, you're getting money for publishing this information, you're a publisher. You're not, you don't get the Section 230 immunity, right? Now that would have all sorts of interesting consequences for some of the debates we've been talking about today. It would have consequences in terms of political advertising because it would be a form of advertising. And it would also have consequences for certain kinds of deals that are struck between platforms and other folks. It might at the margins even have effects with respect to the issue of revenge porn. It wouldn't completely solve the problem. But you can see it's the kind of way of thinking about the problem that might make sense. And you could apply it up and down from the very largest to the very smallest. Right? Whereas there are other ideas which you have in mind, right? I, can, I know exactly what you're thinking about, where it might be difficult to make a distinction between the largest and the smallest. Can we focus on that, on that particular example just for a, a moment? I'm, I'm curious to, to hear Daphne's and Nate's reactions to it. So if you, if you limited um, or if you began to impose publisher liability on the platforms for paid advertisements, um, and, and for the audience, that means that they would, be, they would be treated as the speakers in the relevant context and so could be held liable for the content of that. What, well, they would be, that, that, or rather, another, I would, I'll, I'm going to change that slightly. Let's not go all the way to publisher. Just call, call them distributors. They say they're distributors. Right. Which right. is so, what I say in the paper. The distributor means that they're not the publisher until you tell them that the content they're publishing is illegal. Mm -hmm. So it's a notice and takedown regime. Yeah. effectively. So, yeah, so that's actually, I would prefer distributor liability or publisher liability. Publisher liability has all sorts of interesting problems. But let's just go with distributor liability. Daphne, I, I have a question, but do you want to respond to that? Do you have thoughts on that you want to jump in on or? Uh, no, go ahead with your question. So uh, the question is this, so um, how many problems could legal liability for, for illegal speech really solve when it comes to, say, advertisements? You're, I think you're, you, in the paper you point to revenge pornography and their you know, proliferation of laws that impose liability for revenge pornography. And so you can imagine that shift in immunity and, and liability doing, doing real work. Um, on the advertisement side, um, I wonder whether, uh, and this might go to Nate, whether the real problem that uh, election law experts see in ads is ads that would be legally actionable. In other words, they may be defamatory because they say some false fact about a specific individual, as opposed to um, ads that misinform or, um, you know, have ulterior motives that are, you know, come from people who don't care about our elections. Um, so I guess I wonder how much work that shift in liability would do outside of very discrete context like revenge pornography, where it might do really important work, but may not fundamentally about, restructure. Yeah. Ask me about this information after, after uh, uh, Nate talks. Well, so, so Daphne or Nate, you know, do you, either of you want to jump in on that? Nate should do disinformation. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll do that in advertising. So um, the, the proposal that, that Jack puts out, I don't necessarily have a problem. I mean, the, the, 
question, it seems to me, as is true with any of these moderation or modifications to 230 is, uh, does it retard the development of these small, in, in this context, the retard the development of these small platforms. And so if you make them liable for the advertising, which seems um, uh, sensible, does that mean that it's going to be more difficult to fund a new platform with advertising? That's kind of an empirical question. Maybe it's not such a big deal. I mean, because part, but, but then the question is, well, how big a problem is illegal advertising, right, of the kind of universe of problems? So mentioned the things like revenge porn or, or other, you know, kind of defamatory maybe um, advertising, right? That seems like a pretty small slice of the, of the content moderation problem. Now, when you get to the question of like disinformation and political advertising, now you've, we've sort of opened up a big uh, question here, which is, well, should we beside the internet ads for a second, should we have uh, rules about false claims in political ads, right? That, because one would think that the harm to it on the internet is the same as it would be on television, right? And so there are state laws that have you know, rules about um, false claims in political ads. These are narrow, narrowly construed. Um, you know, most of the time, you know, you've got a lot of what's kind of bias, stilted, um, puffery that you see in these ads. But you can see what the, the problems are when you have any of these enforcement measures on, on truth and political advertising. If you just look at, even though Facebook, you had Zuckerberg last week touting how they don't want to be the arbiters of truth, the month before, they actually put a filter over the Lincoln Project's ad and said that this was, um, you know, partly false, and so therefore you you couldn't see it without suppression uh, because it had a claim that said Trump had uh, bailed out Wall Street at the expense of Main Street. That was deemed to be a false claim or partly false that led the platform because it was relying on a third party fact checker to put a filter over it. And that's the kind of world you live in, right? If you're going to have, in the heat of a campaign, somebody that's going to be deciding whether uh, there are claims that are false in. Yeah. Uh, by the way, it, uh, Alex, the, the proposal I'm making is, is as it's a modest proposal, and it's still designed to be modest. Think about it. Uh, Yochai Benkler uh, and a, a team wrote a book called Network Propaganda, in which he tried to figure out what's the major source of propaganda and disinformation uh, affecting American politics today. You know what he discovered? It was Fox News. Fox News has a First Amendment right to engage in disinformation. Last time I checked, they have a First Amendment right to engage in, in uh, propaganda. They even have a First Amendment right to do what Benkler says they did, which is when Russian uh, disinformation and propaganda bubbled up, uh, you know, from the nether regions, uh, folks, on pro uh, folks in pro uh, Fox News and Breitbart also just basically took advantage of it. And, pro and promulgated, and they, that's what their book shows you what they did. So assuming that that's all legal, um, I don't think it would be legal to basically require uh, Facebook or Twitter to take it down. I just, I just don't think so. So in other words, you might ask, well, how do you deal with this information um, that affects democracy? And the answer is, think about how we dealt with this information that affected democracy before the digital era. So in other words, suppose it were the case that the St. Louis Post-Dispatch or the Philadelphia Inquirer or NBC or the New York Times started spouting Russian propaganda. Well, what would the appropriate remedy be in the American system of government? Well, that's a rhetorical question, but if you think about it, you know, the answer is that what would happen would be there an enormous amount of pushback from different institutions in American society on this. And uh, it would have an effect on the on their business, and it would would shape how they did it. Now, ask yourself, what is currently happening to Mark Zuckerberg? He is getting enormous pushback for some of the the things he did that make sense, and some of the things that are totally bonehead, and some of the things that are probably too inspired by uh, his too close relationship with the Republican Party. That is, in fact, our future. That's not like a temporary event. That is the way it's going to be uh, for the foreseeable future. Can I just add one thing? And, and this is, I'll be channeling my you know, fellow California here, Nathaniel Gleischer, who's not here, which is that it's, you can get at a lot of the disinformation problem without getting at the content of the speech. And so this is what I was saying at the beginning, where you might focus on the, 
particular affordances of the digital, digital platforms or the internet in general that create new problems that are separate from what you see on TV, right? And so the privileging of anonymity, right? The, 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 the fact that virality is now the coin of the political realm. Um, what, what Facebook and, and other platforms do, right, is they, they focus on coordinated inauthentic behavior, CIB they call it, which looks at, it's not necessarily the content of the speech, but did you pretend you were someone else when you were um, uh, transmitting it? Um, it's not necessarily the content, but it's also things like the, the, the technology that is used to propagate it and make it more sort of inauthentically viral by using bots and other computational propaganda and the like. Um, and, and lying, you know, they, if you say you're in one location, but you're really, you know, in St. Petersburg, right? So there are all kinds of ways you can get at the disinformation problem without trying to get at the content. By the way, Nate, you're not asserting that the United States could require Facebook to do this. You're saying that this is a policy decision of Facebook's, correct? Yeah, but there's something that I think they could do. I'm, for example, bot disclosure, I think, is certainly within the right. realm. Well, yeah. Bot disclosure for things having uh, having to do with politics, but not campaigns. I'm trying to figure out what the limits of bot. I think, bot, bot, I think a bot disclosure bill is constitutional, irrespective of whether it's political or not. I mean, it's just about you know trying to figure out. I mean, and, and and this is something that I sort of wrestle with right now. Um, but this is where I've come out, which is that um, you know we are entering a stage where it's going to become increasingly difficult to tell whether you are talking to a computer or you're talking to a human, right? And so if you think the internet poses unique problems, this is one of the ones where you might want to, to, to sort of push the, the levers here. And so I think government requiring some disclosure about the use of, or, or requiring the platforms to disclose when automation has been uh, used in the propagation of, of different types of content, I think is fine. Um, there's real challenges in doing that because, as you know, it's not like there's an on-off switch between what is a bot and what is not, right? Um, and so our colleague Renee DiResta has, has written a bit about this with respect to the California anti-bot bill as well as some of the other things in Washington. But assuming you could solve those problems, I think having greater disclosure for automation makes a lot of sense. Daphne, I'm hoping you can jump in on uh, Section 230 since you are maybe the premier expert on 230 or certainly one of them um, and, and, and give your thoughts there. And then I'm hoping we can turn to, um, to antitrust after that, which has come up a few times. Yeah, I, I wanted to come back uh, to Jack's idea of sort of having some carve outs from 230 that are things where we don't think the immunity is appropriate, you know, where we want instead a notice and takedown system or, or something else. Uh, Jack called this a modest proposal. Um, and I want to agree with that. In fact, I think it's so modest, it's very similar to the law we have now, right? <laughs> because the universe of platform content liability in the US basically has three pieces. There's the DMCA, which is a highly choreographed notice and takedown, a pretty decent, frankly, choreographed notice and takedown. There's 230, which is a complete immunity. And then there's all of federal criminal law. And 230 doesn't immunize anyone for federal criminal law. And that's where things like child sex abuse material live. And every platform takes down child sex abuse material. It's where things like material support of terrorism live. Um, and, and this is why you see 230 experts in discussions of things like non-consensual sexual images or, or revenge porn saying, you know, don't make a hole in 230 for that. Make a new federal criminal law. You know, use this existing mechanism. Now, backing off from that, you know, it's not like really Congress struck the perfect division in saying we'll have strict immunity for everything that's in the 230 bucket. And then like platforms should have regular liability for everything in the federal criminal law bucket. Those are very crudely defined buckets. And other countries have handled that same division in some really different ways. So for example, in Brazil, under the Marco Seville, the rule is for most things, if you want something taken down from a platform, you go to court and get a court order so that there's you know, full and fair adjudication and due process and so forth. And then you show it to the platform and then the platform takes it down. But for some things, including non-consensual sexual images, they do have to take it down under a regular notice and takedown system. And the, the basic dividing line is like, there are some things that are so harmful, we don't want to stop for process or so easy to recognize that we're not that worried about false positives. Um, other, Austria has a distinction in law like this, although it doesn't work very well between manifestly unlawful and 
harder judgment calls content. So I, I, I think what Jack is talking about is not that different from the framing that lots of legal systems, including our own, already have, where there are some things where we want platforms to take action without courts or regulators or TROs or whatever being involved and others where that's a really bad idea. Great, so I'm, I'm hoping we can turn to, um, uh, to antitrust now and maybe go back to Jack and maybe you could spell out for us what you think the goal of antitrust or more broadly competition law proposals ought to be. Um, and I'm gonna also rope in one of the questions that we got from the audience. Do you, if the goal, of the, you know, if the goal is, as you said at the outset, to have a more heterogeneous speech environment, or at least you know, a diversity of, of online platforms, do you worry at all that we see more polarization through echo chamber effects if we had you know, more smaller buckets rather than one big one? So what, what, what would the goal be, and do you have this particular concern? Um, well, let me first talk about antitrust, and we can talk about polarization later afterwards. Um, antitrust. Um, so the first thing to understand is you may think that Facebook is a social media company. That is incorrect. Facebook is a surveillance company that does social media on the side. Uh, that is also true of Google. Google is a surveillance company that does search engines, uh, self-driving cars, uh, free email, uh, and a whole bunch of other services on the side. Uh, the companies are primarily surveillance companies. They make their money through surveillance and then through selling uh, access to advertising networks which they control. Uh, so, the f and many of the bad things that people complain about that uh, uh, Mr. Zuckerberg does or his company does comes because of the profit imperative that comes from being a surveillance company. Okay? So, if you want uh, Facebook to take on an appropriate social role uh, in the digital public sphere, probably the first thing you want to do is separate out the social media part of that business from the control of the advertising networks. That would be an antitrust remedy, but it would not be changing the size of Facebook, but basically dividing by function. So this would be, uh, this would, uh, this would uh, be a, 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 a distinction, not horizontally, but vertically. And so separation of functions uh, and separation of the kinds of businesses that platforms can be in is probably the number one reform that I would advocate for anyone interested in antitrust. I, I, actually, you should work, use competition law. Here's why. Antitrust law in the United States has been basically strangled into a relatively small box. Um, so, but there are other kinds of laws, you could call them competition laws, that don't have to abide by the particular rules and doctrines of existing American antitrust law. They could be passed by Congress, and, uh, and the Associated Press case tells us that they, have, they are not aimed at speech, but rather at business practices, they are perfectly constitutional. That would be the number one reform that I would imagine uh, engaging in. And it would have all sorts of interesting side effects too. If you do it right, it could actually help uh, traditional journalism survive. One of the reasons why journalism is dying and why we have news deserts has to do with the way digital advertising has been structured. One additional point, another problem we have with respect to competition is about antitrust law at all. It's the Com uh, Computer of Fraud and Abuse Act, which prevents certain kinds of interoperable services, which if allowed to develop would solve many of the network effect problems that are created by current social media. In other words, one of the big problems of social media is they have power because they have network effects. But if you, if you change the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and you allow certain kinds of what are called inter adversarial interoperability, then you can create lots and lots of different kinds of services that can interoperate and they can in fact ameliorate some of the network effect problems. Daphne, do you wanna, I guess you kind of nodding your head. So Daphne, uh, in, yeah. I'm, I'm just delighted to hear Jack espousing the inter adversarial interoperability model, which Cory Doctorow has been a big spokesperson for. There's, there's just so much really interesting work outside the academy on this set of issues. Uh, Mike Masnick's work on protocols, not platforms. Um, like th they're really good things to look at, uh, to, to think about the technical barriers, competition barriers, legal barriers to the kind of diversification that Jack is, is talking about. Um, and I'm glad he invoked Corey. And I have a ton more to say on that, but I will hold up. Yes, Corey and Master, both of them, they should basically they should talk about their ideas more. Can I just jump in on this? First, 
Um, there is an interesting tension between the interoperability and the privacy issues, which I think we should talk about. I mean, because Cambridge Analytica, in some respects, the problem was that they were getting access to the ways that, that interoperability would provide. But let, let's just focus on, on the different antitrust problems. So um, it, it depends on which aspect of the platform's monopoly power you think is destructive and then what kind of regulation you're going to use to target that. So um, I'm in favor of Jack's sort of uh, division of uh, industries right, within these large platforms. But if you, if you take it, say, from the democracy perspective, if, you, if you're worried about these platforms, and the power that they have over influencing votes, influencing opinion, and the like, and being that sort of that their their standards as well as their speech marketplaces are too dominant. You know, Google's search engine does not YouTube away from Google, right? The search engine is still going to be as powerful as it is. You take um, Instagram and you take um, um, WhatsApp away from from Facebook, the newsfeed is still you know extremely powerful, and so and the algorithm that that determines the news. Is really powerful. So, so that's where I would end up where I think Jack is in other articles on sort of information fiduciaries, right, which is that these platforms, when they, when they uh, reach a certain level of power, then get certain public interest obligations hoisted upon them. A lot of it has to do with the transparency obligations, because once they become that dominant in the speech marketplace, we really need to know what the hell they're doing, right, and, and to be able to craft policy uh, to deal with that. But the but you know the there are different sort of antitrust interventions that one could have depending on which prop the monopoly problem that you want to solve. Well, that's what I want to get back to. So I want to get back to that you know in particular, and maybe this is kind of back to Jack. But is, is the idea that by separating it, it sounds as though the idea is that the advertising business model, what you call the surveillance business model, just to answer one of the questions that was asked in the uh, in the chat. You view that as being, I think, responsible for the misaligned incentives that um, the companies, when they're operating as social media platforms, have toward their customers and toward and toward public discourse. And so, it seems that your your the idea is that if you separate those two, then when they're acting as social media companies, they have the proper incentives to act as social media companies, and will take on responsibilities that we might want them to take they on. Better, they have better, they're always going to be advertiser driven because they're advertiser driven enterprises, just like the New York Times or every other media company. You understand? You're yeah. not going to get perfect social incentives. It's just better than what they have now. Well, so how do we, how do you, so if the idea though in the paper is eventually to get to many of these, how does that intervention get us to many? Or is it a different intervention that you think gets us to many Facebooks? Yeah. That's right. So I just want to say, you, there's no single bullet here. There are multiple policy levers you have to use. Antitrust can be done horizontally or vertically. Horizontally is size, vertically is function. You probably have to do both. And I agree with uh, Nate's point that just uh, just ripping uh, Instagram away from Facebook, don't do it, right? The more interesting question is, what happens when another when virtual reality becomes more practical? Um, and so a new startup starts up, uh, will Facebook buy it up the way it bought up Instagram? Um, will Google buy it up the way it bought up YouTube? No, let, don't let them do that. So the, in other words, new affordances, new companies, new competition. That's a very important part of what antitrust law is about. Um, the, the, uh, another way of thinking about it is this. Um, in, the, in, the in 20th century media ecology, and I hate to keep using 20th century, but it's because I know it, I'm familiar with it, you had uh, advertisers, you had Sears and Roebuck, you had NBC, and you had Don Draper, right? Don Draper basically acts as a broker between Sears and Roebuck and NBC, right? In our world, Don Draper is the same person as NBC. He's Facebook. Facebook is Don Draper. In fact, he's not Don Draper. He is the world's largest Don Draper. He is enormous. And if you think about what happens when Don Draper, who had no conscience often, <laughs> does bad stuff? Imagine an extremely powerful and enormous Don Draper. And, and you get our world. That's our world. So maybe this is the next question is for Daphne. Can you, and to continue on with the, uh, with the analogy, can you rip Don Draper out of that role? So Daphne, in your paper, you, um, you respond more specifically to Mike Masnick's paper called Protocols Not Platforms, where he makes a version of this argument that- I published uh, mine first. <laughs> <laughs> You cited him. You cited something, not that, not that paper. You cited one of his papers. Um, 
argument that he later kind of crystallized, I'll say, in, in, in protocols, not platforms. And you, you describe some of these proposals, which, and you use the word unbundling to describe them. You say some of these pro proposals are to unbundle different functions of the social media companies and that they rely on, and your quote is, uh, uh, magic APIs, uh, by which I think you mean um, wishful thinking about technologically whether, it, uh, whether the functions could actually be separated in a real, you know, realistically. So can you describe that, uh, that objection and whether your thinking has evolved on whether this is feasible? Yeah, and it's, you know, it's not really an objection. It is intended to flag a big, rich area we need to figure out if we are going to move forward. Um, so, you know, to, to pull way back, I, I think experts in this space, um, understandably, are often siloed. We know privacy law, or we know competition law, or we know speech law, or maybe we know two of them. We probably don't know three of them. And we certainly probably don't also know like anti-discrimination law, you know, these other things that come up. Um, and so it can be very hard to issue spot the, the things that are at the overlaps. Um, there are two really important overlaps that I think um, are relevant to your question. So one is the, the speech competition overlap. And there, I think we actually have like this really amazing 20th century precedent about that. We have cases about things like cable and broadcast that are about this tension between um, a private owner of a communication channel having its own rights, property rights, First Amendment rights, and the users of that communication channel having rights and the public having an interest in what's on that communication channel. And so like, I think internet lawyers all need to be dusting off like Denver area, and maybe not that one, that one's impossible, but you know, Turner, um, these cases, be, because they speak to both of the questions we're talking about. They, they speak to um, when can the government compel a platform to carry speech it doesn't want to, um, you know, to host more diverse content, to do what the executive order wants. They also speak to when can a regulator come along and say like, oh, you're like, forcing your message into people's living rooms. And so I'm allowed to regulate merely harmful content on your platform. But, you know, there's these like playboy issues or issues that come up in the audiovisual media services directive in Europe that Remy talked about, where broadcast is our model for regulators being like, eh, I get to regulate more speech here than I could on a street or in a park or in a bar. So that's this like rich, largely untapped vein. And, and that's the, the, the vein where our models for unbundling come from. So unbundling in the, what I call the, the magic APIs model is you say, okay, Facebook or Google, you are sitting on this trove of user data, behavioral data and content that they've posted and no competitor is ever gonna build up anything like that among other things, cause it would be illegal now. Um, and so we're gonna force you to share it. Um, we're going to force you to, you know, you can keep offering your version of Facebook with your um, content ranking algorithms and your content moderation rules. Um, but you also have to let competitors come along, use that same trove of data and offer like the Disney flavor or the ESPN flavor or the Breitbart flavor so that you get this diversity, as Jack talks about, this, this diversity of different speech rules. But in this version, it's built on top of a resource um, that, that Facebook controls. Now, the problem there, <laughs> or a big problem there, um, is the collision of competition goals or speech goals with privacy goals. Because as Nate said, if you force Facebook to share user data with any Johnny Come Lately company that comes along and is like, I want to build on top of your data, sure, that is Cambridge Analytica. And that's a problem that's really, really hard to get away from. Um, you know, you can say it depends on user consent, et cetera, et cetera. But that, like, those are barriers that are incredibly hard to clear in practice and incredibly hard to reconcile with the GDPR in particular, which is something European regulators are acutely aware of and, and trying to work through right now. But, but my point there it truly isn't that this stuff is impossible. It's that there's really rich, unexamined territory, and, and that's where we should be focusing. I have an aphorism for you. Antitrust leads to privacy. Privacy leads to antitrust. You can't just do one without the other. I like it. I li Wait, I have an aphorism for you. Only operationalizable things happen. <laughs>
<laughs> this is Daphne's rule of content moderation and platform regulation. Like, don't just pass a law that says do X. If X cannot actually be done, like, go write something else. Well, maybe then to, to draw on one of the greatest, you know, judicial aphorists, uh, you know, Holmes always said, we, we have to act in the face of uncertainty. And so I, I want to um, ask you this. Like Mark Lemley just said, I have to choose between antitrust and privacy. Mark, <laughs> you bad, bad boy. Sometimes you can have both. He's what? a troll. No, no, he's not a troll. He's very, very good at, at antitrust and privacy. He's actually good at both. <laughs> Um, so Nate, I want to I turn back to you for a second before we open up to, um, to some questions from, from the audience and we have a, a kind of list to go through. So um, I want to uh, talk, I, I want you to talk a little bit more about your experience with Social Science One. So this issue came up in, in the context of Social Science One where uh, Facebook announced a, uh, this partnership between Social Science One and the Social Science Research, uh, Resource Council to enable um, uh, uh, peer-reviewed research of data that Facebook would make available to, uh, you know, to, to researchers. And that project took 18 months longer, I think, than anyone expected for anyone to get access to data. And the explanation that came at the end of those 18 months from, um, from Facebook was that the legal, you know, they viewed the legal hurdles to sharing this data or to making it available to researchers as nearly insurmountable. Um, so so um, do you view those um, you know, th those privacy, do you view that as a, a kind of credible explanation of what went on, but, but maybe more importantly, as a reason why adversarial interoperability is not feasible, uh, or these, um, you know, the, the solutions that Daphne and Jack are talking about are, are simply infeasible? Well, so I think the sort of research transparency side and then the commercial kind of transparency or interoperability question are a little bit different. Um, I think that, look, I, I mean, I can tell you since I was obviously working with them on a daily basis that they uh, sincerely believe these, uh, that the privacy laws, particularly GDPR, prevented them from giving us the data that we want and that is most useful. Um, and that we've now developed, and we have released the largest social media data set ever now, um, with, but it has all kinds of privacy protections that are built into it that then lead to um, uh, some obscuring of the data in a critical way that would uh, uh, maybe affect the results. And so um, I, it was extremely frustrating, continues to be. There's some new things that will be released this summer, some APIs, and then a research effort that we are undergoing with Facebook um, that, that we'll talk about later. But, um, but yes, it is a big problem. And this is where we need government intervention. This is something Josh Tucker and I call for in our new book, which is like, this is an area where the um, governments really do need to force the platforms to open up um, and to make their research, make their data available for public uh, scrutiny. Now, again, you can do that while respecting privacy, right? You can surveil the researchers, you can punish them and uh, you know, if they mishandle the data. Uh, we do this with census data, with IRS data, some other things. So leave that aside. Now the interoperability question. So, I mean, if the pro, if, if the, the, the benefit or the advantage that Facebook and Google have is, as Jack says, that they're surveillance companies, right? Then the question is, well, how do you give the benefits that they have to other companies without making the surveillance even more uh, ubiquitous, right? And so if, if they have all this data on you, um, how do you then uh, give that advantage to others? And so, I mean, one way to think about this is that you could, um, you know, as I was saying before, thinking about a two-tiered system where you go after the big companies and say that they face some pretty uh, significant restrictions, but we're going to try to incentivize uh, smaller companies to, uh, you know, to, to, to develop these databases that maybe the same privacy rules don't apply to the smaller companies that would apply to the larger companies and the like. But it's, it, it really, as, as Mark Lumley has said in the um, comments, right, that in in response to Jack's aphorism, you've got to choose one, antitrust or privacy. Our colleague Alex Stamos, who used to be head of security at Facebook says, well, not only do you have to choose one of those, right, you have to choose security also. You've got to choose, um, you know, content moderation. And so instead of, you know, the, the aphorism in Silicon Valley, you can either have something fast, cheap, or, um, or good, right? That then you have to uh, choose between about 17 different equities when you're regulating the speech marketplace and you just have to balance between them. And so, you know, we may just need to say, well, we're not going to give all of Facebook and Google's data to competitors, that there's some of it that we think is not terribly privacy endangering, which we think is necessary in order to build up competition. It's worth pointing out, I'll just say this as a maybe 
maybe I'll be my, a, a troll here too. It's worth pointing out that uh, in the choice between antitrust and privacy, the, the privacy choice is leaving all of your data with Facebook. Um, uh, I'll just throw that out there, but we're going to turn to questions. Um, <laughs> and, and, and before we well, turn to said, you can have regulations that are targeting the big companies, right? And so you may you may want to uh, hinder their ability to do some of the things that that's their common business process while uh, making you know creating incentives for smaller companies. Right, right. Well, so, so before getting to questions, I'm going to read the CLE affirmation code. So if you are listening to this to get CLE credit, kudos to you. Here's the code: A M F. A01. That's A M F A01. If you couldn't hear me, uh, type something in the chat and I'll, I'll respond. Um, okay, so I want to get to a couple of questions we have from the audience. So, and go back to the one that I asked before, but that we didn't get a chance to get to. So, you know, a lot of people see, um, they see the problems of that, that antitrust uh, critics point to of homogeneity as the same problems that you might expect a heterogeneous speech environment to create, right? They see um, echo chambers in a homogeneous speech environment as similar to echo, you know, echo chambers in a heterogeneous one, and maybe even worse in a, in a heterogeneous one where you're more tightly packing people into these smaller these, uh, platforms. So wh what's your response to that, uh, Jack, um, and, and anyone else who wants to jump in? Well, you know, again, Bankler's book that came out suggests that um, polarization in the United States does not appear to be caused by social media it appears to have been caused by a series of forces beginning in the 1960s, um, some of which were aided and abetted by telecommunications policies, and some of which were, uh, were aided and abetted by particular political entrepreneurs. Uh, to really know whether or not uh, Bankler is right about this, I think we do have to do a lot of, of uh, comparative studies with other countries to see um, you know, if he's right. His suggestion is that in a sense, uh, social media just comes on and adds to what to the various forces of, of polarization uh, that were already present in American politics. And in my other work as, as a constitutional scholar studying uh, constitutional development, I think he's right about that. I think he's basically right about the American experience. But I'd have to know about Brazil. I'd have to know about Germany. I'd have to know about the United Kingdom. Um, but what I have read suggests that the degree of polarization that we have in the United States is not the same as is occurring in various other countries. We, we seem to have a special kind of problem in the United States. But if that's true, then it can't be because of social media, because there's social media everywhere. There are other problems social media create. For example, social media can be used in order to uh, foster genocide. Uh, social media can be used uh, to basically incite people to all sorts of violence. That's a different problem than the problem of polarization. Polarization is, is is related, but not the same problem as that. Um, if you are worried about polarization, then you should be worried about a lot of features of um, uh, the, the public sphere. You should be worried about the people's ability to buy the, the books they want to buy and to watch the shows they want to watch. You should be worried about Spotify. Uh, you should be worried about Netflix. You should be worried about, dare I say it, Disney. Uh, there are there are lots of reasons to be concerned about polarization. It is not yet clear to me that social media is the prime culprit here. But you might ask yourself, well, what could you do to prevent it from becoming worse, making things worse? Well, for that, I think there are ways of, you might consider how you might adopt the interoperability model, the adversive interoperability model in such a way as to put things in the way of people, that is to say, to give them unexpected encounters. Here's an idea that that, uh, that Cass Sunstein has written about and, um, and has written about by other folks as well. That is important, although it isn't a complete cure for, um, uh, for polarization. Great. Daphne or Nate, if not, I have another question for you. Well, I mean, I, I've got a whole book on, on polarization uh, on this, so uh, uh, stop me midway here. But the, the um, Jack is right and Yokai is right that, that in, if you think about polarization in the, in the sense of the uh, distance between Democrats and Republicans, right, that that is a, a uh, phenomenon law in the making, long in the making. Um, the, there's, when we think about polarization online, we often think about several different things at once. And so part, you know, if part of the problem is um, echo chambers and particularly sort of the dark cesspools of the internet where people can can um, find extremist uh, beliefs and, and the like 
right? That is in some ways new, right? Because if you were a Nazi living in San Francisco and sort of the legacy media environment, it was hard for you to find common cause. Now you have uh, common cause online. Of course, you know, if you were someone who was a particular racial minority in an area, then um, you would also uh, be able to use the internet to find a common cause. So, so echo chambers are, um, you know, benefits and costs. Um, I would say that there are ways to, the, the, the central question, it seems to me, is whether the algorithms um, through their privileging of viral content somehow lead people down a path toward greater radicalization. And that is one of these things where we have some, some assumptions about, say, the YouTube algorithm or Facebook's newsfeed algorithm. But this is where we need a lot better research, that we don't really know how much uh, sort of use of these platforms is actually leading most or even a subsection of the users down a radicalization path. I, on that, I, I would add. Go ahead, go ahead. So I, I think there's like also this deep, like human rule of law question there, which is if, if the supposition is correct that like these algorithms, they're giving you what you want as indicated by your revealed behavior in lingering and clicking. But maybe that revealed behavior is a product of the same part of your brain that stares at the accident and like buys the candy bar at the checkout line, back when we went to checkout lines. Um, you know, it is rewarding the things that your id wants or that your lizard brain wants. And so if, if we think that as a matter of like societal responsibility, platforms should not reward what your behavior suggests you want or not give you what you're acting like you want and instead give you something that you know your ego or your super ego you know that you would want if you sat back and thought about it for a while um you know if we want platforms to force you to eat your veggies when you're acting like what you want is candy um what is the basis for that like what is the theory of human behavior and capitalism and paternalism and like these big set of questions um, that we're relying on to say, hey, platforms give give users something else. What well, do you think, Daphne, that um, the instinct may come in part from, uh, you know, the old media that Jack is pointing to, the, you know, the old media certainly um, uh, peddle sensationalist stories, but they, they have this kind of competing user ethic that also, you know, pushes them toward the veggies. And maybe the answer isn't that Facebook should only show you veggies, but that they should have something that, you know, pushes in a different direction than just, you know, the, the endorphin, the dopamine hit you get from sugar. Um, and I think I'm mixing my metaphors here. Um, but is that, is that a, you know, a, a satisfactory response? I, I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, I, th I think it reframes the question well, but ultimately the question is, like, do we want platforms to give us something other than what we act like we want? And if so, who gets to define what that thing is? You know, because if this is just another variation of the platform should take down bad content and lead up good content, if now we're saying, well, and their algorithms should prioritize healthy content and deprioritize unhealthy content, you know, that's just another standard none of us are going to agree on. And then we have to have a conversation about like, what is the governance mechanism by which we arrive at that standard and who gets to decide? So I think it just, this is, there are far more unanswered than answered questions here. I also say that, you know, it is an open question as to whether our online lives are more politically homophilous, right, and cloistered than our offline lives, right? We're seeing polarization across just you know, media and life right now. And, and the fact that social media might reflect that might not say anything about social media. Also, to some extent, this is a pretty elite conversation we're having where we assume people are on social media to talk about politics, right? Most of what's happening online and in these social media um, uh, platforms is not political, right? And so it may, you know, our news feeds are very different than the average uh, news feed. Most people, their Facebook news feed is no more than 3% news, however you're going to define it, right? And so the amount of uh, sort of polarizing disinformation or other kinds of content is gonna be pretty small as a total share of content. Jack, do you, do you envision, um, you know, in your paper you talk about uh, promoting the circumstances under which social media companies will be trusted intermediate institutions. What, what, uh, what work is, is trusted doing there for you? I'm just trying to contrast that with the, with the view that maybe what we want in social media companies is, you know, 
something that just rewards whatever it is we click on, that maybe that's, that's what we mean by trusted. But what, what do you mean by that? Um, uh, so you can't have a working public sphere unless there are some institutions that are trustworthy. Otherwise, you just have opinions uh, cycling with other opinions. That is to say, so if you think about the public sphere or the system of free expression, we often think it's about the people, uh, the ability of people to talk to each other and not be suppressed by the government. But actually, if you look at how a public sphere works, there are all these intermediate institutions in civil society that turn out to be necessary. Examples, schools, museums, libraries, archives, scientific research institutes, uh, institu uh, various kinds of experts and professionals. These actually turn out to be central to what we mean by a democratic public sphere. Not because everybody is an expert, but because they're available as resources for people to use when they're deciding what to argue about or what to talk about, right? So, uh, and if you in fact get rid of all these intermediate institutions, then what you get is that film, Idiocracy, right? You just get people saying stupid things to each other. So uh, it actually, this is all, it's been hiding in plain sight. It was always a feature of the system of free expression is that you had all these institutions for the production and dissemination of knowledge. The next step is these have to be trusted. That is to say, you have to believe that if you go to the library, the library is not just full of propaganda, but it actually has things that might be true or that, you know, that it, it has a set of resources. If, if you have experts in society, you have to have a belief that the experts exist under disciplines. If I ask Nate personally a question, I have to believe that because he's a Stanford professor, he went through some uh, set of, of uh, uh, disciplines that basically made him good and trustworthy. Well, maybe, uh, yeah, but I think so, uh, right? Uh, so that's how knowledge disseminates and grows. It requires both the sphere of cycling of opinions and the institutions for production dissemination of knowledge. Now, here's the idea. In the, these institutions, these only 10 years old of social media are now gonna take a, a place in that larger system of free expression. In order for them to take their appropriate place, they're gonna have to be trusted and trustworthy. If they're not trusted and trustworthy, then basically they're just gonna undermine all the other institutions that are necessary for a public sphere to work. You see, so they either have to work with and be themselves be trustworthy, or they basically are the enemies of all of these other institutions. That's where we have to get to. And as I said, we're only 10 years into this. You can already see how people are worried that uh, social media are undermining the possibility of knowing what is true and false, undermining the possibility of the production and dissemination of knowledge. That's what people are worried about, among other things. So that's why they have to be trusted and trustworthy. Well, that's a great place to end. We've run out of time. Um, I just want to thank all the panelists for your insightful comments and for uh, managing to do this over Zoom. Uh, so thank you all. I hope the audience enjoyed it. I'm going to hand it over now to the next panel, which I believe is starting right away. It's uh, going to be moderated by Brandon Healy and Jonah Nobler. Um, Milk from Nuts is the title of the panel. So um, enjoy that and thank you all. Thank you.